There we go. Okay, we made live once again. We made it alive. <laughs> now, get on my docs. Sorry. Should have did that first. Got to get to my Nehemiah spot. Okay. Sorry, everyone. I have to get the appointed place here. Okay. There we are. Amen. I think that's good. Okay. All right, then. Um, so we are in the book of Nehemiah. Once again, this is week eight of the Fountain Gate which is baptism in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Everything good up there? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Um, let's just pray and we'll continue. All right? Thank you, Jesus. Yes, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Our precious Heavenly Father, <laughs> Lord, once again, we're coming before your throne of grace and asking for your help in so many ways, Lord. Lord, first of all, you see everything that's going on uh, here in the city and all over, um, not only America, around the world. Lord, the um, chaos, the fear, and the reality of what really is going on, we're not sure ourselves, Lord. But we know, Lord, that um, you have all control, Lord, and you are above all, and everything is under your feet, and we thank you for that, Father. So, Lord, our hope, our trust is in you in the face of all these things, Father, and truly, you are, are our hiding place. Hallelujah. And we thank you for that, Lord. And therefore, we commit ourselves to you once again this evening, Father, in all things, in every way, spiritually, physically, naturally, financially, every way, Lord. We, each of us, we turn to you. You are our hope, Lord. Hallelujah. And you are our Savior to save us in all matters, Lord, in all things. And Lord, even in this night, we need your help with this Bible study. We need your blessings, Lord, and your anointing, Father, and all of us to get a good and a clear understanding because you have been speaking wonderful things to us, Lord, and surely we want it to continue in a marvelous way, Lord, that we can at the end marvel at what you give and how you give and how precious and wondrous you are, Lord, and what you have for us, Father. Lead us and guide us now for your glory, Lord, we pray. And you grant all these things for your great namesake. We're asking truly, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, let's get a little readjusted here. Amen. All right. So last week, we were talking about... Um, spiritual gifts or the gifts of the spirit as paul said in first apostle paul said in first corinthians chapter 12 verse 1 now concerning spiritual gifts brethren i would not have you ignorant and it seems many believers are as at this time ignorant uh even though many of them had them uh we know especially the corinthian church um, God had given different gifts, and Paul was uh, Apostle Paul was trying to teach them not to be in confusion, but everything should be done in order because God is not a God of confusion, 
hallelujah, but power, love, and of a sound mind. So we need this um, right understanding. We need that uh, knowledge of the spiritual gifts and good understanding so that we could continue in a good and in a right way with the right understanding to magnify the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go into what I taught last week, but I'll just uh, continue from there. And I'll say it this way, that there were many in the Old Testament, I believe I also said last week, not just the New Testament, not just in the church, but before the church period, before this dispensation of grace, there were many that had the Holy Spirit. There were many that were moved by the Spirit. And there were many that had gifts of the Spirit. So um, if we come to someone like uh, Solomon, you can turn to First Kings. First Kings chapter 4. Verse, um, well, first of all, before I even get to that part, um, in chapter 4, we see in verse 29, it says, And God gave Solomon wisdom, and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart. I'll stop there before I continue. You remember Solomon prayed and he asked for wisdom. So what does that mean? It means he didn't have wisdom before. <laughs> Hallelujah. He didn't know what to do. He was never king before. He didn't know. I mean, he can see his father. He knew the problems his father had. His own brothers gave his father problems. And so many were trying to uh, take the kingdom from him. And uh, how long King Saul was chasing after Solomon, I mean, after King David, he saw the different problems it was to be king. And he is asking this wisdom and understanding to deal rightly, to rule the people of God, because it's a great responsibility to deal with the people of God. You know, as Jesus said, you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. What kind of responsibility is that each of us have? Never mind Solomon right now, but each of us, we need wisdom. <laughs> Hallelujah. So Solomon asked for wisdom to deal rightly. And it says, and God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt. So this wisdom came from God. It wasn't Solomon's. It wasn't what he acquired. It wasn't, you know, as he said, Solomon said in uh, Ecclesiastes or uh, yeah, mostly Ecclesiastes. He sought things out and he experienced different things and found out this is vanity. That is vanity. This is vanity. Many things he acquired through experience in God's wisdom. It wasn't, you know, people have many experience and they don't gain one iota of wisdom. So it's not a matter of gaining or just through exercising this uh, uh, faith that we have, but God gave, as it says, Solomon wisdom. Hallelujah. So what do you think? It's like, oh, here's wisdom. Here you go, Solomon. Of course, it's by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. I mean, it's foolish to think God does it any other way. It is by his spirit. Amen. Again, if we look in Exodus, Exodus chapter 31. Even though I have it in my notes, I like to put it in my Bible too. 
chapter 31, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the, the tribe of Judah, and I have filled them with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. So God is having this tabernacle built, and he gave this wisdom to this brother here. Hallelujah. Not everyone had that gift. Not everyone had that wisdom and understanding. You know, understand when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, again, there's the gift of uh, wisdom and the gift of knowledge, right? I mean, we have that in, described in the gifts in 1 Corinthians. So we have these gifts, and these gifts were being used at this time also because it is by the Spirit of God. The same way if we come to Daniel, you can turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. We know that the children of, of um, Israel, such as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and other young people, and many, were taken captive, right? So here we have in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had an understanding in all visions and dreams. Hallelujah. So, again, this is by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. The, again, the reason I'm bringing these things to our understanding is because, as I said last week, many, especially of the Pentecostal people, we are under the impression that people who are not Pentecostal um, don't have the Spirit of God or don't have whatever they do by the Spirit of God. And no doubt there are many dead as doornail churches. I'm not saying not. And it's just a form of uh, religion and just, uh, uh, you know, going through the motions of a service. We understand that. But there are some that are not Pentecostal um, who weren't brought up that way or don't think along those lines. They weren't taught that way. For instance, Apollos. What happened with Apollos? Do you remember? Let's see if I wrote that down somewhere here. In the book of Acts. Chapter 18. Book of Acts. Chapter 18, look at verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Hallelujah. So he didn't know the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But it says, verse 26, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Hallelujah. I mean, that's a wonderful description, the way I look at it. It is wonderful. Hallelujah. Because this man had this uh, knowledge and this grace in his life, yet he only knew the baptism of John, which means he was born again and he was baptized, but he wasn't baptized in the Spirit. So they expounded to him the way of God more perfectly. He knew the way of God but he didn't have this understanding and this knowledge and even to even ask for this baptism of the Spirit. And here it was, they expounded to him more perfectly, hallelujah, the way of God. So there may be many of us that are in the way of God. 
including Pentecostals, many of us, this is what we're speaking about, that the gates are burned with fire. It means the doctrines are, they're up in the air for everyone. You know, it's to pick how you want it to be. But it shouldn't be that way. Shouldn't we know the right doctrine? Shouldn't we know the right way? And shouldn't we know it more perfectly the way this uh, uh, Apollos did? And it was someone who told it to them. Who? Aquila and Priscilla, because they were really in it with Paul. Hallelujah. So now, isn't it right that um, this man who's being used by God used be used even more and more perfectly, more powerfully? I mean, he already was being used wonderfully and powerfully. Why not more powerfully? Hallelujah. And more perfectly. You know, his way is perfect. Hallelujah. We don't want to settle for, well, you know, God has used me up to now. That's good enough. Or, you know, it, it's silly to think that way. Don't we hunger and thirst for more? Uh, at least I do. I, it ought to be that way. Hallelujah. <laughs> Okay, let's go back to this uh, point here. I don't remember if I said this last week, but I'll continue. We were talking about the gifts, that there's the gift of faith and all these different uh, gifts, but we all have faith, but there's a gift of faith. Hallelujah. I don't know. Tell me, anyone on Skype, did I go into uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11? Look in your notes, Laurel. I don't think I did. Oh, maybe I did. 11, you did. I did. Okay. Okay. So let's do this. Let's go to um, Genesis. Genesis chapter 20. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 20. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but if we look from verse 1, we know that um, Abraham was married to Sarah, and uh, he came across this uh, king Abimelech, but from the very beginning, Abraham told Sarah when they left their country, he told them, wherever we go, you're going to say you're my sister. And uh, you're going to, I'm sorry, you're going to say that I'm your brother and I'm going to say you're my sister. Okay. Because they were actually half brother and sister. Right. So they came across this place with uh, Abimelech, this king. And um, as they came to him, um, this Abimelech took Sarah, the wife of, of Abraham, and um, made him, uh, you know, part of his harem. He didn't, you know, go near her or do anything, but that could have happened in time. And evidently, some time had come to pass because God shut up all the wombs of all of his wives and all, and his, all the women, um, the men's women. And... Um, I guess they didn't know what was going on at the time, but we see when we come to uh, verse 3, it says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and he said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. <laughs> we used to say that when I was kids. You're dead if I get you. <laughs> at least in Brooklyn we did. <laughs> But here, this man was caught here, and, and he was shocked because in his dream, God is telling him, you're, you're but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a, a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother? In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou did this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. You know, if you just stop right there and think about it, 
This is an ungodly king. He's not a godly king. But see how God was able to control him if he wanted to? Hallelujah. You know, uh, to me, it's a marvelous thing because we think, oh, God can only use me. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I have such understanding in the word of God and this and that. I know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, as many uh, uh, people on the radio will say. But this king doesn't know A, B, C, or D, but somehow he stayed away from this woman. Hallelujah. That's not usual for an earthly king who's not a godly man, first of all. Hallelujah. But it happened, and God even gave him this dream. Amen. You know, I was even thinking, I was saying to my wife, you know, this man who God gave wisdom to, to help not only one man, many people had wisdom in building this, this tabernacle, right? In the book of Exodus. And all through this time, through the wilderness, they had wisdom from God by the Spirit of God in all different kind of work. They saw the Spirit of God move in so many ways. And yet, <clears throat> with all that wisdom that they had, how many of them made it into the promised land? I hear out there? <laughs> Two. <laughs> Two. Caleb and Joshua from the original. Well, they were part of the original. So where are they? You know, this is important that we, uh, we realize God gave wisdom to a lot of people. They didn't make it. So imagine how much we really need God's wisdom. We need these gifts to be moving in our midst. People think, oh, uh, you know, I'm saved, that's it. Nothing's stopping me. But I see many people being stopped from serving God over little things, you know, and, and they go on in this uh, bubble thinking they're fine, but you're not fine. <sighs> anyway, here we find, I also withheld thee from sinning, against me therefore i suffered thee not to touch her now therefore restore the man his wife for he is a prophet and he shall pray for thee and thou shalt live and if thou restore her not know that thou shalt surely die thou and all that are thine therefore abimelech rose early in the morning and called all the servants and told all these things in their ears and all the men were sore afraid you know uh, i'll continue then abimelech called abraham and said unto him what hast thou done unto us and what have i af have i offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is thy kindness, which thou shalt show me unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. Now look at verse 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Hallelujah. So what does that mean? 
Abraham had this gift of healing also by God's Spirit when he prayed, right? How do you think that was? You think it's Abraham's own, uh, you know, great prayer? God healed them. Hallelujah. So it is gifts of the Spirit. I'm proving that it, there were gifts of the Spirit before the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Come with me to 2 Kings. I have it all here. 2 Kings. Chapter 5. Verse 1, this is the story of uh, Naaman, the Syrian uh, captain of the guard, and, um, of course, the prophet Elisha. Look at verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Okay. Look at verse 7. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, he didn't rent out his clothes. This wasn't a tuxedo uh, rental. It means he, he tore his clothes. Sorry, I had to add that one. <laughs> so he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man should say unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Now, this king, even though he's king, he realizes, I don't have any power to heal anybody. <laughs> I'm not God. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, uh, I think a lot of these uh, TV evangelists think they are God because, uh, you know, the power of the word is in their mouth. But it's not so. We are not creators. We are not the healer. We may have the gift of healing as the Spirit gives and distributes these gifts, but we are not the healer. Hallelujah. As uh, Peter said, why do you look on me as though through my own holiness or through me that this man stands you, before you whole? But it's by uh, the name of Jesus and through faith in his name that this man stands before you whole. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And it was the same in these days. This king knew that he couldn't recover this man of his leprosy. So it came to pass. Sorry, oh, we're in verse 8. Uh, no, verse 7. And it came to pass when the king of Israel read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does send unto me to recover the man of this leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent unto the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Now we know this is also a type of salvation and of cleansing of sin, but remember these things actually happened, okay? Verse 10. 
And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpa rivers of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in a wrath. Verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prodigal prophet had bid thee some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith it to thee, wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in, the all, in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But Elisha said, Well, I'll take that. And you could also buy this mug for eight fifty. I don't think so. But he said, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, um, salvation is not for sale, but somehow it has become for sale. But it didn't come cheap. It cost our Lord Jesus Christ his life. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Point being we see there was healing, gifts of healing, wisdom and knowledge, gifts of healing, and miracles, miracles. Exodus chapter 4. We're talking about gifts of the Spirit, right? That they were even in operation in those days. Exodus. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I'm I'm really trying to bring out to you, or at least I realize this is what the Spirit of God is bringing out to you, that many Pentecostal people think that people who are, they might be saved, they might be water baptized, but if they're not baptized in the Spirit, they can't do anything by the Spirit. Well, none of these people are baptized in the Spirit here. How come they're doing things by the Spirit of God? Think about it. You know, I know we're supposed to go by the Spirit, not use our brain, but sometimes in simple things like this, use your brain. I mean, isn't it simple enough to see? But everyone wants to feel like they're greater than somebody else. But unless we understand that we're all nothing, the Spirit of God really uh, has a difficult time using us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, miracles, gift of miracles. Exodus chapter 4, I'm sure you'll uh, realize the miracle here. Verse 1, God was talking with uh, Moses and Moses with God, and Mo Moses is trying to say, uh, you know, this can't be. I'm not the one. You chose the wrong guy. I can't even speak. They're not going to believe me. And he's continuing here in verse 1, chapter 4. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. Moses fled from before it. That means it wasn't just a vision here. It became a serpent. That is a miracle right there. Hallelujah. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. That's the second miracle. Who's going to take a, a snake by the tail? Yet he did it. He, he obeyed God. Hallelujah. Okay, he took it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand again. And it says, verse 5, 
that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Now um, put now thine hand into thy bosom. His hand, I'm sorry. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Hallelujah. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And again, it was turned again as his other flesh. Hallelujah. Gift of miracles. Of course, with Moses, we know it doesn't stop there. Chapter 14 of Exodus. Turn to 14, Exodus 14. We know the um, people of God had their backs against the wall, so to speak, or against the cloud, and their fronts against the uh, Red Sea. Um, several years ago, my wife and I were at that Red Sea. Um, it is a beautiful sea. Hallelujah. And I had one of the privileges of, of being there. Many people try to come up with this idea that, uh, oh, well, if the wind was blowing real strong and there was a shallow place that uh, uh, they could pass through, that the ground would become, uh, you know, dry. They come up with these ideas because they don't have the spirit of God. I can tell you that. If you can have an excuse like that with your reasoning, something is wrong somewhere. There's a disconnection. And even your salvation to me is in question when you speak with such foolishness. Because how many millions of people passed through that Red Sea? If it was a small little piece of ground uh, of sea, do you think uh, um, they'd be all be able to pass through without the enemy following them so easily? I mean, hardly, the way it took them? It's just ridiculous they come up with these things. But, okay, you know, that's the History Channel's uh, idea. But if we come to the reality, look at verse 13 of chapter 14. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Fast forward to 21, verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided, and the waters were I'm sorry. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. Uh, let's go to verse 26. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. Okay, I'll stop there. The reason I'm sk skipping the verses because I'm showing that it wasn't that God just did it. He did it when Moses stretched out the rod. Hallelujah. So we're understanding that he did it by the Spirit of God. It's not that it just happened from heaven. We need to understand this connection because with the church today, why does God even need to use the church then if he would do everything straight from heaven? He's used, he used prophets then, and he uses the church today in the place of prophets. Even though we have prophets and apostles 
and evangelists and pastors and teachers, we as the church take the place of these individuals with the different gifts. Of course, Jesus Christ being the head, hallelujah. But through the head, the spirit flows through the body, hallelujah. And through the gifts that he distributes, the body members can um, perform the things by the same spirit as we read last week. We're given it by the same spirit and by that same spirit, Holy Spirit, these gifts are administered and uh, and performed or done or worked, as we say. Hallelujah. So we should not get mixed up with this. It's a very plain operation. It's just that we look with our eyes and see what goes on and we try to make the Bible fit. Don't do that. Let's read the Bible and let the Lord change us and make us fit into his plan, into his purpose. Hallelujah. But see, the problem is many that have gone before us are mixed up. I mean, they mixed up a lot of things. That's why these walls are broken down and the gates are burned with fire. And there's been denomination after denomination, church after church after church. And when we get saved, we feel like God can do anything until we look around and say something is wrong. It must be me or this is the limit we have. And we go along with the program until we realize something's wrong with this program. And that's why so many are disappointed. I was talking to a lovely sister who I know for since she's four years old or three years old, I think. She's uh, about 30 now. Yeah, she's about 30. And, and I know her for her whole life. And um, I was talking with her today, and she said, Uncle Bob, <laughs> I'm just disappointed every place I go. I wish we lived in New York so that we could uh, have some good teaching. So I gave her the, the, the um, YouTube uh, channel here so she could be with us. I don't know if she's on now. But um, anyway, my point is many disappointed, as she said she was, I know many that are disappointed with the churches. And it shouldn't be. Shouldn't it be that we're being encouraged when we go to the church? Shouldn't we be revived when we come out? Shouldn't we say, wow, I, I really understand this now? Instead of, well, I'm more confused than when I came in. Or just apathetic and say, they don't know, and I don't know either. But we'll find out when we get there. That's not the time to find out. We want to be useful now, don't we? Hallelujah. So I hope we're, we're getting the points here. Wisdom and knowledge, um, miracles. I'll give one last one because there's two minutes left. Again, coming back to Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 2. I don't know what all these ringings are, but somebody's phone and there's no one here but me and you, Laurel. <laughs> it's one of us. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Um, in Second Kings, again with Elijah, we see Elisha, I should say. But in the second chapter, we're finding Elijah, and Elijah, of course, had this Elisha as a young man uh, following him every place because he wanted what Elijah had. Hallelujah! It reminds me of, uh, of Apostle Barnabas. I wanted to stick with him like glue because I wanted what he had. <laughs> Hallelujah. And um, here we see um, in this place in chapter 2, come to verse 8. They were on these waters here, and they had to, to, they had to pass through. It says, Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. Hallelujah. So it wasn't just uh, uh, Moses who performed the miracle. We see here with Elijah performing this miracle. And not only that, we find that uh, later on, this Elisha um, smote the waters and said, where is the God of Elijah? And the same happened for him. Hallelujah. So they had this gift of miracles. Amen. Well, I have the, the 
wonderful gift of going overtime a lot, but I'll I'll do my best to stay on right now. Okay. I hope um, these things are more clear to you. I know they're more clear to me. Really, they are, and I'm uh, I'm enjoying it so much. And I hope that you're enjoying it. Hallelujah. So, Lord willing, um, we'll be back next week. That was um, the Fountain Gate Part 8. Lord willing, Part 9 will be next week. Amen. As long as they don't shut down the internet for some reason. Hallelujah. All right. God bless you all. Let's, uh, let's just pray once again. Thank you, Jesus. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, <laughs> truly we do thank you, Father. How clear and wonderful and um, and plain you make everything, Lord. Because you're not trying to make it difficult for your children, for your church. You want us to understand. You want us to be fruitful. You want us to, to ask and receive the things that you have for us, Lord, the way as parents, we want our own children to ask, Lord, when they need something. And especially when we know we have something for them, Lord. Hallelujah. So, Father, we, we come to you and we, we ask you to grant all that you want us to have, Lord. Truly, we need you, Lord, and we need the things that come from you. Because we are of this earth, earthy, but we want to... Um, um, have the image of the heavenly Lord, and we know it's only by you that we could have these things, Lord. And you grant it to each and every one of us. Distribute how you want to distribute, Lord. Use us how you want to use us, Father. And we know it's your spirit that is going to use us how you want, Lord. Hallelujah. Not how we want. So we turn it to you, Father, and we commit ourselves into your care because truly, you are the potter and we are the clay, not for our own use, but as earthen vessels for your wonderful and precious use, hallelujah, to contain the things that you have, Lord, that we might pour out to others also, Lord, who have need and be useful to turn them to you, Lord, hallelujah. We thank you for this wonderful new and living way you have made, Lord, hallelujah. And we want to go in this way more perfectly, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We surrender all to you now, Father, once again, and give thanks in the precious, precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. All right. God bless you all. God bless you on Skype. No, there you are. God bless you. Let me uh, end the stream. And... Bye-bye.